Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for stopping by for this conversation. Um, I know it's the end of the day, and, and we're, we're small as a group, but I promise you that you will be enlightened and delighted by <laughs> this panel here. They're, they are the smartest people that I've met in quite some time. And, and, yeah, well, <laughs> don't forget you have to write me the check, right? <laughs> So, so just quickly, I want to introduce everybody to you. We've got um, Cassandra Frangos from uh, Cisco, where she runs executive development. We've got Kristen Sharp, who, Kristen is a Washington Beltway creature who has moved into running a um, project between New America and What's the news company? Bloomberg. Jeez. Bloomberg, thank you very much. To look at the future of work in all of its aspects. Um, and and it's, it's a fascinating project. We got Matt Siegelman, who is the founder and CEO of Burning Glass, which does the, sort of the first big data company in the space and doing really interesting things with skills mining. Rob Rubin. Um, was the engineering guy at edX in the very early days of edX and is now a, um, a thin margin player inside of Microsoft, which means he's got a lot of freedom of movement, being the director of learning technology, is that right? Learning science. Learning science. And on the far end from 10X, we've got Sam Heider, and Sam is the talent development manager for a project called 10X, which is um, unassumingly about real estate development, but they are attempting to scale in a way that no company has tried to scale before. And so there's an embedded learning problem, right? Lear learning is how you get up the curve. And so together, we're going to talk about <coughs> how you know when there's a skill that you're going to have a problem with and what you do about it. I mean, that's the, that's the, the underlying thing of the, of the script, which says outlining your strategy is one thing, finding the talent to deliver on that strategy is another. As economies evolve, a growing gap is developing between the skills in the workforce and those needed to successfully execute growth strategies. How can you know who should be in your workforce? In order to identify the skills gap, you need to understand the skill genome of your employees. Is it easy? Is it hard? When should you build and when should you buy? And how do you make the staffing and sourcing decisions of your human capital? Great question set. And everybody here is uniquely positioned to do it. And so I wanted to start out with, I, I think it's an example that, n that maybe none of you are familiar with. Over the, over the past decade, the HR department and the marketing department have had to become publishing operations. They've shifted dramatically from the business that they were in a decade ago into something that is about audience development and communications. Um, <coughs> and so the talent shortages are hard to articulate and severe. The, 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 the pay that a working writer can command in an HR operation is now $150,000, $175,000. Because the publishing business is relentless. And you have to have valuably done writing in the distribution chain to make content marketing work or to make employee communications work. And, and so, so there are these big publishing things. And, and so my question, and we're going to start with you is how would you have foreseen that? Yeah, good question. I think you know, it's, it's a matter of having the DNA in the company to figure out where the company's going from a strategy perspective and also predict a bit of the future. I mean, we'd probably, in this audience, all love to be futurists and predict you know, what exactly we'll see in the future. But it's having a few people who are really good at seeing the future. So I have the pleasure of working for John Chambers who's the CEO of Cisco, and he had this gift um, as our CEO for 20 years to see around corners and to really be one of the thought leaders in the tech industry to really see where some of this space is going and figure out where jobs need to go and where education needs to go in the future. And you know, he's gone to the, around the world to transform countries. So 
there's a DNA I think you need to have in some of your key people that can predict some of the future capability that you need it. But it's also tied to your strategy to really figure out where you're going. So in terms of the, the way you think about communications or HR, it's also, you almost have to be paranoid to say, well, how do I keep up? How do I change? How do I make sure that your function stays relevant? And I would say John made that DNA inside Cisco where you're always paranoid. You're always trying to think of what's the next big trend. And so our communications and our marketing and HR functions became more digital. Um, so he definitely set the footprint around digital, uh, but he made those functions paranoid to say, where do we need to go from that perspective? So, so I'm, I'm going to continue on with Kristen and just sharpen that question a little bit. But being visionary, that's, that's, that, that's good, but I am unaware, outside Microsoft did actually do this, but, but I'm unaware of a company besides Microsoft that started letting people blog publicly as a part of the HR function before everybody else in the entire world was doing it, even though you could see that HR was going to become a publishing operation, right? And so, so in your thinking about the future of work, how does that play out? Um, uh, yeah, I appreciate the um, impact of a visionary thinker and, and how important that is, because I, I think that there have been some companies that have really set the standard for and, and sort of set out best practices on that front. But what we do at the Shift Commission um, is looking at how automation, artificial intelligence, other digital technologies and platforms are changing industries and um, sort of what our country needs as a, as a total set of skills. So I'm not sure that it is possible to predict exactly what we think will be coming down the pike. And I think that part of what, what any company or any organization needs to do, or country needs to do, is to plan out how to respond to different challenges as they come up so that you have, you have sort of an imagined option in place for lots of different things. And so what we've done is taken um, taken existing trends that we see and sort of extrapolated. If that one particular trend becomes more and more prominent, if the contingent workforce drives more and more people to have more and more options and need to be um, individually driven in their careers more than having a very specific plan for advancement the way we structure a job right now, what does that mean in terms of a potential future for the United States? If we go all in on technology and automation and, and artificial intelligence and use use that as the foundation to build on for lots of different jobs, what does that look like if we're using huge sets of data to, pre to not, not to predict, but to sort of analyze and think about what the next step is in everything? What does a very almost sci-fi-esque world look like? And so I think that in trying to, to identify and forecast what options might be out there. You need to take as wide a scope as possible and say, you know, for some segment of society, any one of these things is going to be true. And so how do you match the skills for that segment of a society with, or that industry with the things that are coming down the pike? So I bet you have an idea about this, Matt. Um, the caveat I would offer to that, first of all, I fundamentally agree that we need to be uh, we do need to be predicting, we need to be, um, use those predictions, and I, and I actually, one of the things that we've seen is that actually you can predict. Um, and you can predict beyond just at the level of extrapolating current trends, but you can look at an array of things um, that give advanced signals, that give bellwethers in a way, um, that let us actually, with a startling level of accuracy, see what's coming down the pike, um, as you described. But I, I want to um, just caveat, though, um, the notion of saying, hey, look, we're going to go all in on certain kinds of things. We have this broad lens. We're going to go in, all in and, and really develop those as central pillars. Because on the one hand, um, we do need to be extremely proactive about this stuff. But I want to just uh, you know, sort of think back to not so, uh, not so long ago history. Um, one of the things that we've learned is that centrally planned, centrally planned economies don't work. Um, and when we start to think about the job market as a centrally planned economy, where in we're going to make big infrastructural plan bets. Um, you know, uh, socialist countries always talk about their five-year plan, their 10-year plan, and so forth. 
um, and then they'd wind up with uh, a, a surfeit of people with of a different, you know, everyone needs to be an engineer. So in you know, a certain year in the <laughs> Soviet Union, everyone would go to school and then come out an engineer. And, and so we just need to be careful that rather than uh, developing, and I don't think this is what you're saying, but, yeah. but then rather than creating a centrally planned economy, that what we're really doing is getting better at both um, uh, anticipating and then responding to signals as you described. No, I think that's a great, can I jump in and clarify slightly? So I, I think that's a great point. And what I was getting at is that we want to, to be in a situation where there are, you know, we have a number of different options and all of those different options yeah. have potential plans that we can follow up on and potential avenues to different jobs. We've been in this situation for the last 30 years where we had a very specific sort of pathway to the American dream where you, you know, study hard something, you go to college in that subject matter, you get out and you have a career in that and you try to advance through the same company to, so that you can yeah. buy a house, send your kids to college, etc. And we're getting to a point, I think, where there will be more options for people. You could, you could shift different things in your careers. You can have more than one career. You can do you know, some things for companies and some things as an independent worker. You can, you, you know, we're, we're thinking about different options for how to do That's that right. and trying to create pathways for people to do any one of those things. So it's, it's more like, how do you get from the ground up the signals that you were talking exactly. about? Exactly. Yeah. So, so Rob, you sit in the middle of this learning science universe and we're talking about increased mobility inside of the workforce based on skills that some employer has invested in in order to solve a market need. Um, and so the, the questions that fall out of that are pretty interesting, right? The first one is, um, how do you get just-in-time delivery, right? I understand that you can't bet all in, but the contemporary lag between the educational product and what the, what the workforce needs is paralyzing. And, and so you need just-in-time delivery without going all in. And then you need to somehow accommodate the fact that what you've just done is set your people free and they're gonna leave as soon as they finish the class, sort of. Right, so what does that look like to you? Yeah, I, that's, a, that's really a great question, John. I, I look at this challenge as a systems challenge. And uh, we know, for example, that Skills maps that lead to roles are really not well defined. Um, and we also know that the, you need skills maps in order to define your career. So you go to a gym, do you have a gym membership? Or are you trying to uh, move the analogy to medicine? Or are you taking a pill for a specific disease? That's a complex system, that's a network. And so as an individual, you need to self-regulate. And how do you self-regulate if all you see are multiple different job descriptions without skills maps and roles? And even if you look at that, how do you look at that with the velocity of the change in the skills map and know what curriculum actually maps to that? So I, it's hard, you know, if we look at real systems right now and we think about it, there's a reason eBay works, there's a reason Airbnb works, there's a reason that doctors share surgical techniques and there's a reason why pharmaceuticals have to go through a process. There's no reason that we can't view this as a complex system where companies can get together to define those skills maps, where competitors can try to solve those skills maps with their curriculums, with their project-based offering, with mentoring, with AI or machine learning. Or there's no reason why we can't certify these and track the evidence, imagine that, share the evidence, retaining the special sauce as patent or hidden, but share the evidence of the outcomes and put some network together that's gonna collaborate and also compete. And I think it's, you know, every company wants to solve this themselves and they should solve their strategy problem. But if every company tries to pour money into training, we're not going to move the needle at all. And so it's a systems problem and not an individual company problem is my view on it. So I'm going to be very practical about it. Um, you know, the company I'm in is trying to disrupt, their mission is to disrupt a $2 trillion real estate market commercial and residential. 
Now, to do that, they have to think different. So rather than getting to the fidelity of looking at skills from the standpoint of competencies or you know, really high fidelity you know, sort of skill sets, you can kind of decompose a person's job into this X number of skills you gotta need, you're gonna need. We look at it in the aggregate and say, what are the core foundational things we need our people to know and do? So no matter what comes their way, they're able to quickly upskill, adapt to the change, and move, uh, move, move with the company quick. And so we look at things like teaching everyone design thinking as an example, because it's something that will serve the greater good of the company as they think about new approaches, new ideas, and new ways of disrupting the market. We also have this, you know, this kind of construct we call the guide system, which helps to create operational um, discipline around execution of our program. So we, we tend to think of things in terms of, in the aggregate, what do people need? How can we design a workforce that's intelligent, that has higher order thinking, you know, so, the, so that no matter what problem arises or what changes or pivots the company needs to make, they're adaptable enough workforce to move in that direction, which includes upskilling. So that's kind of how we're thinking about it and how we're drafting up our sort of three-year plan of attack around disruption. So, so I get that, but, but if you don't have specifics, right, it seems to me that every intersection of skills has some level of tool usage in it, and the tool usage is where, this, where the stickiness in learning is. It, it's got a mm -hmm. sort of a hard cost to replace a tool set problem. Yeah. Um, if you don't identify those things, if you don't say, that's the thing, mm -hmm. then the cost of the pivot is high. Cost of the pivot is high, but, but the way that I think about it is with the advent of new technologies that allow us to map a person's gaps to a specific set of tools, resources, learning opportunities, that's something that's going to be quite ubiquitous for us. We can buy that and we can do those, we, we can do those, those kinds of mappings. So in my mind, it's not a burden that we, we inside of our organization need to take on. Other companies are doing it for us. Our question is how do we take that and quickly apply it to our needs so that we can, we can know what that is ahead of, the, uh, you know, ahead, of the, ahead of the pivot and get everyone upskilled in time. So I'm not, I'm not really as concerned about that. There's a ton of players in this space trying to figure that stuff out. Okay. Fair enough. So, so let me come back to you. The, ne the next question in the queue is, you're the CEO of a big hardware company, and you discover that your future is over there. Um, how do you know what to do, and how do you tell what over there is? Does that, is that something that you find out inside of the labor market? Is, is, is it becoming the case, right, this is, this is an extension, is it becoming the case that the labor market is the most competitive part of business? Um, you know, for us, it all boils down to employee value proposition. It's really an attraction issue for us. Where we, you know, where we have our headquarters in the middle of Silicon Valley, it literally is a war for talent. Mm -hmm. We don't find that same issue in New York or Austin <laughs> or Southern right. California right. where we're at. It's strictly there. So when we think about where do we concentrate our efforts, um, it, it really is, is within Silicon Valley because that's where we have the hardest time attracting mm -hmm. the right and future talent that we would need ahead of the pivot. So I think we're still working on that. It's a working process. It's so true. I mean, Silicon Valley, I mean, you can sit in Starbucks yeah. and hear the bidding wars of, okay, let me get, pay Absolutely. you a million dollars, two million dollars. Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just the, the war for talent is so fierce in yeah. Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, it's, and you can't can't keep up, so you do have to have something unique that your company offers, yeah. and something unique where you want to grow your career, where you want to stay, because it's yeah. so competitive. Yeah. I live in Boston and travel to Silicon Valley, and mm. I, I don't see it in Boston as much as I see it in Silicon Valley, and even on the airplanes you can hear what's happening, and I've even had to say, excuse me, please don't use that person's name <laughs> in, the, in the aisle, because they're, they're one of our star players, so yeah. <laughs> You know, the, 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 the thing is, though, I mean, it is absolutely true, right? I mean, so Silicon Valley is, is um, a, um, you know, an exceptional set of dynamics that go on in Silicon Valley. But we don't want to build, um, make the mistake of building a job market that's built around um, Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and its There's foibles. There's plenty of people doing that. Um, and, um, and it certainly has a number of foibles. It, it is useful as um, both parable and as laboratory. Um, because of the intensity of the same kinds of 
um, uh, of trends that are characterizing a much broader array of, of jobs. Uh, John, you asked about, um, you know, sort of, uh, I, I think you said a hardware chain or, or something like that. Let's call it a Home Depot or a Lowe's or something of that sort. So I'm guessing what you may have had in mind. Um, and, you know, at one level you can sort of look at that and say, okay, well, um, not so hard to source um, people manning the till at, at Lowe's. Um, and it's not. Um, on the other hand, um, the fact that they don't put a lot of care necessarily into that process yields a, um, a startling rate of turnover, which has tremendous organizational cost. And what it also does is it tends to starve the, um, the further north job. It, it deprives them of a natural supply chain. Um, so even in squat pyramid industries like retail, where there's lots of jobs at the bottom, not tons at the top, um, they run around with significant um, pain points that they talk about around um, even sort of uh, line level management jobs, store managers, assistant store managers and the like. Um, and so some of that really does come down to the fact that they aren't creating those um, defined learning paths. They aren't uh, that lead people to where they ought to go. They're not providing the signal to people about what the benefit to them is associated with learning. Um, and they're not, as a result, able to respond as, uh, as some of the skill sets in the organization change. Yeah, so, I, I actually think that the, the most crucial thing to do isn't to think about the um, matching talents and skills and for skills forecasting for the highly educated people who already are working in companies. I think that the crucial thing to do is to think about the ways in which we can have opportunities for advancement and opportunities for um, sort of creating a good job and a good life for people at all levels of the income scale. And that, that you know, it's, it's certainly you're right that Silicon Valley and New York and things are instructive in, in the very, very high levels, you know, what's working in terms of recruitment and things, but, but what we really need is all different paths and exactly. what we don't have right now are ways to do that. I, you know, when, when we run shift commission meetings, we often start the discussion with, and the, the meetings are generally pretty high level leaders, and I always start the discussion with what was your first job? And a surprising, shocking number of people started out in retail, you know, just like as the cashier at the Gap or mm -hmm. as a host or hostess at a restaurant or waiter and worked their way up into business or into whatever industry they're in. And if we don't have that kind of, we, if we haven't mapped the skills for what's today's equivalent of that, we don't have a pipeline of people who will, who will be able to grow their skills. I would just add to that, we, we've been doing a lot of work, in fact, actually mapping what are the pathways um, away from automation, what are the pathways um, up from retail in particular, because it is such a massive um, set of, of uh, jobs and such a massive problem of people moving from one low-level retail job to another low-level retail job. Um, and yet, um, those pathways are there, they just aren't marked. Um, we know that um, there are pathways within retail, but there are also pathways beyond retail into fields like banking, into healthcare, even into IT. Um, you know, there's a phenomenal pathway that starts at, at Best Buy, for example, and moves up from customer service and sales and Best Buy to the Geek Squad, um, and then into help desk jobs and, and an array of, uh, of access. Now, on one level, that's, that's a important um, uh, policy issue and social issue of how we mobilize America's talent and make America more competitive. But it's also a fundamental commercial issue for employers. And that's why I'm glad you asked the question you did, John. Um, because at the end of the day, um, you know, one man's ceiling is another man's floor and one man's career path is, a, uh, is an employer's supply chain. Um, it's so funny that you talk about retail as a starting point. It was for me, too. I was a five-year-old making change at my grandpa's candy store right next to the BMT in Brooklyn, New York. And in the mornings, <laughs> I get there before school, and that started my career in computer science because I couldn't make change. I, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't subtract. You know, if, you, if, you know if, if a candy was 10 cents or a cup of coffee was 10 cents, I'd add a dime and get 20 and add another nickel and add, and, become, and that would make a quarter. So I knew how to make change that way and that was algorithmics. And you know what? My poor brother and sister, they learned to do that too. 
And that was called mentoring, and that was also called agency. My grandfather supervised me. Um, and that's true today, too. I mean, I think that we're talking about, in one sense, what 10x needs to do to be competitive in a market. But, you know, this, you know one of the themes of this conference for me has been we're in nation and company building mode. We really are. Uh, if you heard Arnie Duncan say that, I was blown away by this. And so, yeah, we've got to get our companies to succeed. One of the things I love about Microsoft is our mission statement, which is we want to enable everybody on the planet to do more. That means they've got to learn more. And the challenge is what are those pathways to being able to understand their career and their adjacencies. And that can only happen if we work as a system. Microsoft pours money into edX, where we've put all of our courses on for free. Several million people have already taken them. But we also want to be competitive. And that means we have to have a map of what the skills are that are required internally. That doesn't mean that the large companies can, can abdicate their responsibility. Large companies today now have a bottom line of energy utilization in the cloud, right? They want to know how much energy Amazon now reports, Microsoft reports, how much reusable energy they have. They also have a social responsibility obligation. There's a culture at Microsoft. I mean, Microsoft is one of the most philanthropic companies I know of. We have to say that we have a societal problem. And if we solve this skills map, if we solve this problem, a rising tide will float all boats. And the pain is at every CEO's desk. They can't hire qualified people at, as Matt put it, the top of the pyramid. So if I were to just summarize this last segment, I would say that, that we have some basic agreement that the way that you tell what you don't have and what you need is by having a good picture of where you're going and what that means. The other piece of that is having a clean picture of who's here and what they have to bear on the problem. Right? That's, you you got to know where you're going, you got to know what you got. When I look out at um, HRIS systems, which is the storehouse of all of this supposed knowledge, um, where a LinkedIn profile is updated once a quarter by most people, the internal HRIS system is only 25% complete and rarely updated. Uh, and so the, the question of how you get to a good inventory of who's on your team and where you want to go with them is, it seems to me it's a pretty challenging space. What do you think about that, Matt? I think um, a lot of it comes down to um, how you proxy for what you have. There's easy ways and hard ways to, to solve this. The hard way is indeed to say, you know, I'm, uh, uh, we're going to take a census of everybody in the organization. We're going to enforce compliance. And you, I, I, you always hear about organizations that say, yeah, we're going to mandate this. OK, well, that's great. Um, with what vigor? Um, are people going to actually um, adhere to that, uh, that, that uh, mandate? Um, on the other hand, um, people leave signatures, um, and workforces leave signatures. And so to the extent that you can even sort of proxy based upon um, something as simple as saying, what are all the positions that we have in the company? We have 100 people in this role, and we've got 10 people over here, and whatever. And we know overall what the skill profile of those roles is. Now, is it possible that people have additional skills or that some people aren't fully qualified for the existing role? Absolutely. But as an 80% solution, does that give me a sense for what my workforce looks like and what's the overall shape of my existing talent pool so that I can at least get some sense for where are we today, what are the skills that we have, and what are the skills that we're missing relative to where we're going? It's a great place to start. Yeah, I'd say calibration is probably key. It's probably one of the areas we, we don't do well in corporations. You know, as an example, like, it, 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 you know, not too long ago, I, I sent a, a note out to all the senior leaders, and I said, what is your definition of employee potential? <laughs> Just give me two or three words. And every one of them was different. Right. Every one of them. Mm -hmm. So part of what I think about is, like, current state, where do we have gaps, where do we need to fill them? 
but then future state is what's the potential of our current employee base to take on new, more complex, you know, mm -hmm. higher order roles or d completely different roles as we pivot. Um, we haven't cracked that. I don't think there's an organization out there that can do that. But I'll tell you one thing I am, I'm quite um, I'm happy about is where, where we're going with AI and machine learning. Because you know, the, the, um, the idea to me is that somewhere housed within, <laughs> within the data centers of Microsoft, Google, Apple, um, and others, um, is an inventory of the subsets of, of what, what is the X factor in our employee base that is that potential that we're looking for. I just feel like one of the biggest hurdles we have is that, that, you know, th that data is typically not shared. So a subset of that data rests with, you know, with, with you guys, a subset rests with, let's say, you know, let's say Google, a subset rests with LinkedIn. <coughs> but if we aggregated that data and used machine learning, then we can get to a, I think a place where we could be much more predictive about what our employees are capable of doing. I think today we're just not there. So, so I start in saying we've got a systems problem, but I don't believe that the top of the corporation can solve this. I think that in the same way that our software has evolved, so remember when databases were on mainframes? I don't see a lot of people that can. I have enough gray and there are lights in my eyes. But, um, but then we moved to the era of a database on your PC and now we have all sorts of tools that so simplify it in the cloud. So, Individuals have agency, marketing departments have agency, and especially lean and agile teams have self-organization at their core and recalibration and retrospectives which equate to learning at their core. Why do we need, as Matt referred to earlier, uh, one person in HR determining what we need to do? Why isn't the agency at the departmental level or at the team level? And I think that teams need to know where they need to go. And you'll often find engineering teams that want to move from one programming language to another. Do they have the agency to do that? On the other hand, if there's legislation like the EU privacy uh, that's coming in in 2018, you, you need the corporation to say everybody has to be aware of this privacy because it impacts you. So I think there is a balance and I don't think that it's a central planning. I think the agency has to move to the self-empowered, self-contained teams. I and I think it's gonna be the same shift that we saw with software, which was an, in an IT department, down to that agency for learning, for skilling, for using that against the strategic plan of the CEO. I was just gonna connect that exactly to that point back to Cassandra's point at the very beginning of this conversation yeah. because um, you can give people agency as long as they have a set of guiding principles that um, they're right. moving toward and, and that those principles are the company's strategy. And I think too often um, HR exists as a function that is divorced from corporate strategy. Um, okay, well, there's people we need. Okay, we need to go and fill those roles. But the notion that the company strategy drives um, the how we move from a current talent shape, what's our current organization, to a future organization, um, you know, is is key. And I think it also ties to John's point. The very first question you asked or comment you made, John, was how HR has become a publishing business. Um, and so in general, this comes down to a question of can we publish effectively within uh, the company and outside the company, what is that strategy? Um, and then when we screen to your point, uh, Sam, for the kinds of um, people who can um, exert agency and be agile, then, then you can accomplish great things. And the earlier uh, panel I was on, we talked about this experiment. We have this, the, the rise of teams is inextricably tied to success. There's no doubt about it. What I find so interesting is we're still solving for the individual, mm -hmm. um, and yet it's the team that actually, uh, it's the unit of one, is the team and not the individual when we think about success in, in our organization at least. 
So there's a different set of dynamics that take place when you start to assess how do you grow skills because self-governing teams will govern themselves. They will upskill each other. They're the ones who will give feedback to each other. They're the ones who will turn the manager into a coach rather than a traditional manager. Everything changes. That's right. um, but I think you're right. It does that the success of those are predicated on a very strong vision, on a very strong understanding of where that company is going, and how all of your work ladders up to that uh, that larger sort of end goal. Yeah, and I, I would just say, in, in a prior life, I worked for Bob Kaplan and Dave Norton, who founded the Balance Scorecard, and they used to say, "Strategy is a team sport." To your point, Matt, you know, it's really we have to solve it together, and. Also, how do we look at ourselves as a team? So I can't have all of the capabilities uh, needed to run something, but John has a set of capabilities and Kristen mm -hmm. does, and so together we can make something that actually can be achievable. Right. So it does have to all connect, and I think to the point where we have to be global problem solvers and solve all of this together as well. It can't just be one company or one set of individuals or one team. It has to be pulling it all together. Mm -hmm. I just want to build, riff on this a little bit, mm -hmm. but I think it was Candace Teal who was speaking earlier yesterday, and she spoke, she, she quoted Herb Simon, who said that content development is no longer an individual activity. It needs to be a team sport, and I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. right, I'm, yeah. I'm totally munging this in bad ways, but, but I think the essence <laughs> is there. Content production from one person in HR was already overloaded. Perhaps we need a way to crowdsource content mm -hmm. and enable agency among teams to produce that content, to curate that content, and to direct the projects around that content. Just a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. so, so I want to drag something out of you now, which is, your purview is development, right? And, and we're talking about this world in which agency is a primary driver for people, but the world, the world that I read about has 34% of the employees engaged in the work and 60% of them disengaged in the work. And, and so, so maybe agency is the egg and you get the chicken out of it, but, but that's a big bet, right? So, so what, what would you say to all the stuff that you just heard, given the sort of the realities of, to be a culture, you have to be stuck, sort of. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I agree with everything that's been said, and I think it's a matter of figuring out what inspires you. I mean, I think there's been a lot of talk at this conference and in the literature about bringing your whole self to work and authentic leadership. And, you know, I think people are not as engaged uh, because they felt like they couldn't really be themselves or bring their whole self to work. It was, you know, it used to be sort of, oh my goodness, I have a health issue in my family. Uh, John Chambers will say, I need to know every employee that has a health issue that's serious. Uh, so every day he wants a report. Uh, you know, my mother is ill right now, so he'll call and say, is there anything that I can do? Um, I know the CEO of Stanford Medical. I know the CEO of Mass General. What, what can we do? Uh, so that actually inspires me uh, and it makes me more engaged and by people knowing that there's a ripple effect um, across Cisco for that uh, and so we choose we choose to be in or out and we've talked about this issue where also the collaboration and the agency and you think about all of these issues we've been talking about it's how do we come together to solve world problems we've started an initiative some of you can go on and, and see it for Cisco but it's global problem solvers um, and it's corporate social responsibilities running it, but it's how can we together solve some of the world's issues? Um, and so that's gotten our engagement way up, and we've, you know, it's not just Cisco, it's actually a collaboration across the world. Are you tracking this question of engagement? Yeah, we are, and um, having, done, um, having done future planning sessions in six cities across the country, um, uh, focus groups across the Midwest and surveyed, you know, thousands of people. We find that this is a real problem because the in almost any future scenario that you can envision, the one of the common themes is that it requires people to be self-directed in finding the opportunities and identifying what they can do in getting, you know, sort of a strategy and connected to the right skills and all of the things. 
But what people say they want out of a job is stability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, overwhelmingly. And really only until you get to people who make over $150,000 per year when you start to see purpose and agency and wanting to, you know, work for a company that has a good culture and do good as a very high priority in jobs. Do you see that? You you see for most people that they want to know that they are getting a, a paycheck at the appropriate time, and that you know they'll they'll have a job going forward. And so we I think we need culturally to have a new way of talking about if an if what we expect out of employees now is that they're self motivated and self and entrepreneurial. Like what's the pathway for that, and how do you you know how do you talk about that, and how do you get people able and willing to do that? We, I don't think we have a answer for that right now. I've got a really practical example again and just in the vein of, of grounding this in real, in real terms. So at Atlassian, the founders are Australian, the company is Australian. They founded a tech startup there about 12 and you know, 13 years ago and um, they had nowhere to turn. Unlike Silicon Valley where you can meet with people who can help provide the insights and inputs to help start this up, they decided to go from scratch. But what they decided to do, which I thought was really interesting is they went from, they, they, they founded the company based on a set of first principles. So the company founders asked, actually, asked me this question, which is what are the first principles around learning? I didn't have an answer for them. I actually had to Google it and find out what it meant. And, <laughs> and what I find, Wikipedia actually states that first principles are the basis from which something is known, which I thought is really profound. So the, the, when they started the company, they said, you know, how do we want our employees to be? What do we need out of our employees? And, Daniel Pink wrote about it in his book, Drive. Autonomy, Mastery, and Purpose. So everything that they do around employees is, has a first principle founded on that idea that we want employees to have as much autonomy, freedom, and a purpose and a vision to go after, to keep them engaged. And if you look at some of the artifacts and some of the rituals that they've got, like ship it days and things like that, they're all based on that idea of continuous engagement on those three principles. Those are three levers they use in a lot of, uh, a lot of ways, including how they construct a workplace for maximum engagement. You'll see that some of their workplaces are, con are designed in a way that actually, uh, you know, where th those three things can actually thrive. Um, so they've, they've gone from nuts to bolts, from the hardware to the software, from teams of people and, and to individual, um, in individual engagement. And they, they've done, just done a phenomenal job. But I would challenge companies that want engagement have to go back to that premise. What is our first principle? We have around employees. And their engagement with the company. That's great. I'll just say, I want to talk about engagement and learning for a second, just to pick up on this little tune here. Um, so Microsoft introduced the Microsoft Professional Program in Data Science. The conventional uh, outcomes of MOOCs are 4 to 6% completion rates. And so, you know, we put out the professional program, which consisted of three sections and each of which had three or four courses and a comprehensive project at the end. Um, and we were amazed to find a number which was a 30% completion rate across a mandatory eight set of uh, eight courses and the capstone project. So I, I did a deep dive into this data and I found something astounding, which was, who were the successful learners? Um, there were different strategies among millennials. Millennials would attempt the assessments first and then watch the videos. My contemporaries did everything in order sequentially. Unpredictive. What was predictive was how many, time, how many assessments somebody did. In other words, the hypothesis of learning and mastery is you have to make mistakes to learn. And we saw it in the data. The more successful people, the more, and by gender, by age, completely same result. It was, did you attempt more assessments? And the other follow-up on that was just in the female population. I, I don't know who the uh, leader of Girls Who Code is, but I've heard her YouTube, and she said uh, that women tend to try and won't go on until they complete something. And we actually saw that in the graphs, which was that the female population actually tended more towards the right side of the success of having done 
even more assessments than necessary to move on. And so willingness to fail, opportunity to fail, is part of engagement. And we know make successful entrepreneurs and totally. make successful companies. I hope that was relevant. Pardon my geeking out on the data here. <laughs> it's who I am. <laughs> You look like you have a twinkle in your eye on this one. Who, me? Uh, look, I completely agree. Look, I'll tell you, a, a, a hard statistic went into it, started to implement lean startup principles and allowed teams across the company to form in small teams, test ideas, prototype ideas, and then went back and looked at employee engagement. They went up by five to seven points. So there's something you know, startling about that statistic in the sense that all you did was give them freedom and a methodology to try and fail things in, in, in an idea. And that completely, completely changed the dynamic of what they thought about um, the company. I, I want to connect that, if I could, uh, to the point that Kristen made before, um, which is a really profound one about security. Um, because everything that we're talking about here around engagement is from persistence, you know, that, that part of engagement is, is manifest in persistence. Um, and we persist, I would argue, when we have purpose. Um, in turn, um, for a lot of people, as, as Kristen described, that purpose is, in fact, security. Um, and so there's a, a little bit of an irony here. We're saying, hey, we need people to be able to fail. In order to fail, you need to feel that security. You need to have security in your job. You need to have um, uh, security in your career. And that goes, um, uh, and I would argue that part of giving people security is giving them mobility. Um, in a job market which is changing, um, which is highly dynamic, um, the notion that you can get into a job, and I think increasingly this is part of what fuels so much public anxiety, as everyone knows, in you know, my job, and I'm, you know, there's all sorts of this automation coming, there's bots are going to eat my lunch. Um, if we give people um, the avenues of mobility um, and show them what in signals as to how they can advance, in turn, ironically, people wind up um, from that mobility with more security. Um, and I think when they have that security in turn, they can persist and engage. Mm -hmm. yeah, and to Cassandra's point earlier, not, Chris, you know, it was empathy. Mm -hmm. What an extraordinary part of a learning culture. I, mm -hmm. I was really touched by that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting also, I mean, to Matt's point, the other part of that is you have my back. We did some engagement work around do my team members have my back? Not my boss. I mean, you certainly want your boss to have your back, but you know, does your team have your back? And that's, um, that's also part of the empathy as well is you have my back when you know I need to run out to take care of my mother or you have my back when I failed. I mean, the culture of failure is really important to actually keep you know, keep persisting on it's okay to fail and you'll have my back if I do fail. Um, or if there is some family crisis, you have my back. So those are, I think, interesting things that you can weave together around engagement. Well, I, I wish we could do this all afternoon because there are four or five really wonderful questions about freedom and how much of it an organization can tolerate that pop out of that. That's exactly how do you set the tone of a learning. But, We've exhausted our time. And so if you would, I told you they were smart and that you'd do well by staying here.